All right. So just to remember, I'm I am going to set my um, phone. Even though we go over and all sorts of other things, it's still a good practice to know how we're doing against the clock because um, it matters in the future. Um, yep, doing that. So does anybody have any questions about the email I sent you after class last week? Um, this email, just so you could see it, um, plus, um, I am planning to stick around tonight after 830 um, to see if any of you have questions about your next assigned text. Um, the good news is you have two weeks uh, before you um, present. All of you have an extra two weeks because we don't meet next week because that's fall break at uh, Concordia Irvine. Um, and I did have so I did have conversation this week already with uh, Carol Ann about her next passage, 1 John 2.20. And um, who else did I check in with? Um, I don't know. I had a couple of meetings this week, but um, so you, you can ask questions after class tonight, or you can we can do it um, some other time as well. But I, my thinking is that everybody is going to benefit from every conversation that's had. So we might as well do it uh, when we're all here. Um, so I wanted to get back to a couple examples we, we didn't get to in the first place. Um, so this is something that like, um, what was that word? Um, it was the word that Daniel had that he didn't know the word love. There we go. He didn't know that he had to beware that there were two different words for love being in his text. So here's another example. If you look at Matthew 1 verse 19, um, her husband Joseph being a just man was not wanting to put her to shame, was wanting to divorce her quietly. So your assumption on the basis of English is that you're dealing with the same word, yes? So, so Joseph didn't want one thing, he did want another. If you were to pursue this in Young's Concordance without any assumptions, what would you find is that there's two different words here, both translated want. So the word, the first word used for want is thelo, T-H-E-L-O-O. Joseph was not wanting to put her to shame. The word thelo in Greek means that this is something you want or don't want, and this is how it's going to be no matter what. Also can be um, what we want can also be translated as our desire. So guess what? When, um, when Paul wrote to Timothy that God desires all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth, did you, did you suppose he used this word? This is what God wants no matter what. How would you verify that understanding of this word? Because he actually did it. So at the cost of the life of his own son, he redeemed the whole world so that none would be lost. Now, whether in, 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 in time or in the future, some would eventually be lost, that's a separate question. But on God's side of the equation, here's, here's what the word means. I want everybody to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth no matter what. And there you see evidence of it in the redeeming work of Christ. Contrary to John Calvin, for example, who said Jesus only died for those people who would actually be saved. The other word is bulamai. That's kind of a fun word to say, bulamai. That also means to desire or to want something. And so the text goes on to say that Joseph was wanting to divorce her quietly. Did Joseph divorce Mary? No. Why not? Because God intervened to explain to Joseph that Mary was pregnant by, by the Holy Spirit, not by another man. So bulamai means that you want something only because you don't know what else to do. So I want something unless or until I know more than I know now, until I realize that I have a better option or a way forward. Um, and that brings us actually to something I teach in New Testament all the time about this sequence of things, because notice the word betrothed in 118. That's, a, that's an old word for being engaged. Yes? Okay. So if they're engaged, but not married, why does Joseph have to divorce her? 
Good question. Okay. Um, and many of us were raised to believe, at least I was, <laughs> that the whole reason for getting engaged is so that you have a, a back door, right? You have an exit strategy. So if I'm engaged to a woman or a woman's engaged to a man and I realize during the, the course of engagement, this is not, not actually something I wanna go through with, I can just quit. I don't have to go through any legal proceedings or anything like that. And more than once, somebody's showed up at the altar and been alone. But historically speaking, once, once a man gave his word that he would be husband to a woman, there's no backing out for him. So he would actually not only have to divorce her, but he would have to make uh, an, an argument. He would have to prove why he's divorcing her. So I drew a little diagram to help students to get their minds around this. So here's the sequence uh, in antiquity, at least among uh, the Israelites, is that marriage began with a public declaration of intent to assume responsibility, a man for a woman. Okay, but talk's cheap, right? So, so a man like Joseph would go to the gate of the city where men, as they had um, opportunity, would meet. To, to take care of all kinds of legal affairs. And so the men at the gate, the elders of the city would hear Joseph say, I, I would be husband to Mary. Okay, we got, we heard it. Now we're gonna see. So, so the elders and the men and the people of the city would watch Joseph for a time, much more intently, because we need to see if Joseph is made of the stuff that would be a good husband to Mary. Once Joseph has, has demonstrated to their satisfaction that he is a, a good husband to Mary, then there's a public celebration of that commitment of Joseph to Mary, and only thereafter the private reception of Joseph with Mary, where they consummate the marriage um, physically and then, and then go forward. Interesting, isn't it, in our culture, at least in my culture, I'm not sure depending on where you live, but what goes on today is actually the opposite. In other words, there's a lot of hooking up with, that's the term kids use now. There's a lot of um, recreational and promiscuous um, sexual intercourse between people that all goes on privately. Um, and sometimes that's the old thing called a one night stand and you move on. Um, if that was a good enough experience to pursue a relationship, then you might go do things in public together. And if that was a good enough experience, you might, um, you might, might announce your engagement um, publicly. And then only after that would you publicly declare that commitment in a marriage ceremony or a wedding. But in the biblical direction, notice that there's less cause for divorce and certainly less reason for a woman to have regrets if the elders of the city took responsibility for, for um, discerning whether a man is actually going to be a husband to a woman as God intended or not. So anything about betrothed and divorce, anything about two different words for wanting or desiring something? Okay, okay so one of the triggers, I was talking with uh, Nathan about this before the rest of you showed up, is... Um, What's the same about all of these texts that I assign to you is that there's some kind of question or issue involved with them, right? So if you were reading this text, if I assigned to you Matthew 1 verse 19, what you would want to notice is there's two words for wanting in here, right? So, so what's going on? Is that the same word? Is it a different word? Why does he have to divorce her? Why quietly? It's a good thing. It's not hard to understand that Joseph doesn't want to put her to shame, got that. But what's the relationship between the two clauses here? What he doesn't want and what he wants to do and, and but eventually doesn't, okay? Here's an easier example that I didn't give you. Um, everybody knows the word worship, right? Go to a worship service. Um, we're all going to worship our Father in heaven, so forth. But what does the word actually mean? Does anybody know the Greek word that's translated worship, what it means, literally? No one? Is it 
prostate? No, prostrate. Pro <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so prostate is that is that gland that men have problems yeah, yeah, with yeah. when they're my age. <laughs> prostrate means what? Uh, Joel, tell us what it means to prostrate yourself. It's to um, you like yeah. It, yeah, you're bending over, bowing. Yes, yes. Have you ever heard the word genuflect? No. <laughs> no. Anybody else genuflect? No. That's a big word in, uh, in Roman Catholicism and Eastern Orthodoxy, lots of genuflecting going on. Well, your genus in Greek are your knees, right? And fleck as in flex them. So you bend your knees. So it's not just a bow at, from the waist. It's more of a, it's full on, um, if not on your knees and bowing, it's actually face down on the ground. Do you remember Indiana Jones? In the, in the crusade for the Holy Grail, and he has to go through the first test, right? Only a penitent man shall pass. Look at Hannah, you right with me there, right? And so he figures it out just in time. A penitent man is humble, boom, on the floor. There we go. So look at in the text, though, and remember the ep exegetical chi in Greek, which is and in English. So the wise men go into the house, they saw the child Mary with his mother, and they did what? They fell down. That is to say, they didn't fall down because they tripped over something, or because they had too much to drink on the way from Jerusalem to Bethlehem. They fell down because that is a demonstration of, right, um, your relationship with someone you're in the presence of. It's just, it's just a good idea, right? Hit the deck, and um, let, let the person that you have come to see be in control of raising you up again. Think about the Magnificat of Mary, which, which has some very um, significant parallels with the Song of Hannah from 1 Samuel, right? And you get this theme through the Bible. What does God do with people who exalt themselves? He brings them down, right? Every mountain and hill will be brought down. What does he do with valleys and the low places? He lifts them up. So the humble, he lifts up. So always better to, to go low here <laughs> and then have the Lord raise you up. So worship. So it's very simple. Um, and and it's, um, it's kind of a body language or a body position in relation to someone else that's real that sets the, the tone, right? It's a, it's a physical demonstration of our demeanor. Um, do any of you worship at a church where during the consecration of the Lord's Supper, the pastor genuflects? See, that's a very powerful moment, right? Uh, Jesus said the night he was betrayed, take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you, and everything stops. And the pastor goes down on one knee and he puts his hands on the altar and he puts his head down and then back up. And the same thing with the cup. Isn't that a powerful moment, right? We're not, we're not in the presence of a God who's far away, but he's right here, right with us, right in this space, right on this altar. That's very powerful witness. Okay. Um, I want to go back last week to the stumbling block. Um, this was one the one Carol Ann presented on, and I don't see her here tonight. Okay. So, First um, uh, Corinthians one twenty three, Christ crucified a stumbling block to the Jews and folly to the Gentiles, but to those who are called the power of God and the wisdom of God. Okay. So, when I teach this in uh, in New Testament. I, I get the students to think about with a with a picture what's going on here. What's Paul talking about? Okay, so let me get the, um, the highlighter going here. Okay, so let's talk about to the Jews a stumbling block, to the Greeks folly. Okay, so here's the Jews. Okay, who's this fellow? This would be one of the religious leaders of the Jews. Notice what he has his hand on. So this is the bar, right? So, so the law says, do this and live. And you re might remember Jesus in, in the uh, Sermon on the Mount sort of, sort of summarizes the law by saying, be perfect 
as I, the Lord your God, am perfect, okay? In, in more detail, 10 commandments and so forth, okay? So what the, what the religious leaders of the Jews did is they dropped the bar from, from be perfect and the 10 commandments to the 613 that they invented, like you can't make mud on the Sabbath, so that they could claim to keep those laws. Yep, see how we are. And, and you can hear Paul say this uh, in one of his letters, according to the law, guiltless. Paul's not talking about he was guiltless according to the moral law. He's talking about according to the 613 mitzvot, the commandments of the Pharisees, never broke one of them. But notice that they're not going to lower the bar so low that other people could claim the same thing. So it's good for us, not for you. And the, and the Jewish claim, we have superior DNA, we have superior rituals, we have superior traditions, okay? So not to be outdone, here's the Greeks. <laughs> so here's the leaders among the Greeks. So I, I wouldn't claim that I'm a god in terms of Greek mythology, but I'm close enough. I'm the closest thing you're going to get on, on earth. So they too lowered the bar. They too claimed superior DNA. They had their own traditions. They had wisdom. And what's that look like? So uh, let's do the Greeks first. Okay. What's folly to the Greeks about Jesus? Well, in, in Greek empire thinking, right, who does the giving in the Greek empire? In other words, who's who provides for the wealth of the kingdom? Does the king do the giving or do the people do the giving, right? The Greeks do the giving or the non-Greeks do the giving, right? And if there's a contest over this, which is war, who does the dying? Does the king do the dying? No, no, the people do the dying, okay? So the idea that God took on human nature and died under the curse of the law that's crazy. That's not how this works. Who would do that, right? For the Jews, and here's the stumbling block moment, okay? Notice for the Jews, this is the power of favoritism. We are God's favorites. That's why we have promises that everybody else doesn't, okay? So if you're the favorite, who does the serving? Do you do the serving or other people do the serving, right? Do any of you have uh, siblings? Um, and, and you're the favorite or one of them's the favorite. I know from Uma that Uma's brother's the favorite. Uma's the not the favorite. Absolutely so, correct. We all know the Cinderella story, right? Cinderella gets to do the serving and not the stepsister. <laughs> and when it comes to favorites, who does the obeying, right? The sheriff's, the sheriff's sons, they don't drive the speed limit. The mayor doesn't worry about where he parks his car. Everybody else needs to worry about that sort of stuff. And so for the idea that Jesus, as the Son of God, is God's favorite of favorites, and because of that sets everything aside to become the lowliest of servants, um, that's a stumbling block. I can't go there. It doesn't compute in my way of thinking about things. Questions? Okay. This is, the, this is the last piece about the stumbling block for the Jews, okay? So, um, and, and Carol Ann showed us a little of this last night. So think about the relationship between the law, the curse, and crucifixion, okay? So cursed is everyone who does not keep all the things written in the book of the law to do them. That's what the law says. What does that look like? That looks like dying by crucifixion. Follow? So if you were a noble person and you had lived a noble life, but there was but there was some cause for your execution, if people were honoring you, how would you die? You'd die fast, fast and painless. But because you are held up to contempt for people, you're going to die slow and painful. Okay. And so you see, hanging on a tree actually is sort of code for crucifixion. It, it would also be hanging from the neck by rope. Remember um, um, uh, Absalom, yeah, Absalom, right, gets caught in the tree hanging between heaven and earth because he's cursed. It's not an accident that Absalom died like that. Okay, so the Jewish 
the Jewish religious leaders, they get it. You're cursed if you don't keep the law. That looks like dying by crucifixion. But here's the stumbling block. Okay, they're waiting for a Messiah, right? We can't wait for this Messiah to get here, okay, because he's going to redeem his people, which is us, the favorite people. Okay, now in the Jewish mindset, what did redemption mean? Because, because of that red pyramid world mindset, they thought that redemption meant vindication against foreign powers. But what was actually meant from Adam and Eve, uh, Genesis 3.15 forward, is this vicarious piece, which most people uh, don't know about. And I didn't, I didn't know about that until I read um, uh, um, a, a little privately published book by Kurt Marquardt, who used to teach at the Fort Wayne and Seminary. He's passed on now. Um, and, but what he wrote was simply called um, Justification by Grace. And that's the first time I ever was introduced to this concept of substitution. So that's what vicarious means. So think about this. If the Messiah substitutes himself for me and then is executed by crucifixion, what does that mean about me? Does that mean that I can that I'm I'm being honest if I say I keep the law? Or does that mean I must not be keeping the law because that's how I'm supposed to die? Follow? So you see the stumbling block? Uh, can't follow there. Nope. So that's, that's it. Sort of, you kind of put the pieces on the page there, and then it becomes easier to follow kind of step by step. Which brings us to our, um, the long-awaited Kevin Kong presentation. Anticipation, Kevin, has been killing me for seven days just to get back to see what we, we missed last week. Uh, one more minute of anticipation. What's the question? So I assigned three of you. Kevin and Nathan and Kingston all had this phrase, in my name. Okay. So what you're looking for is what's the question or the challenge in each case? So to, to jump ahead and give you the, an explanation, um, in Kingston's case, John 16, Jesus said, if you ask the Father anything in my name, he'll do it. Yes? Do you guys, do, friends, do you realize the power of what Jesus just said? Is that, can that really be true? It's unequivocal. If you ask the Father anything in my name, he'll do it. So I remember as a boy um, in my, um, let's see, I wasn't, I don't think I was, maybe I was nine or 10. And I remember praying very fervently, because that seems to be important, very fervently for the weeks before Christmas, dear God, please have my parents give me a motorcycle for Christmas. In Jesus' name, amen. Guess what? No motorcycle. Uh, see why people don't take the Bible seriously? Later on, when I was in my early teens, I tried it again because I was desperate. Dear God, please terminate the life of my sister. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs> Once again, disappointment. <laughs> okay, I had an elder in my congregation in Montana that said he used to pray to God for money. And every time he prayed to God for money, God gave him more work. So he learned not to do that. Have any of you pray, prayed for patience? Don't do that. If you pray for patience, God will give you tribulation. If you pray for wisdom, God will give you the wisdom to, not, to know better than to pray for patience or more money. <laughs> okay. Um, I didn't assign anyone that first petition of the Lord's Prayer. Hannah, what's the first petition of the Lord's Prayer? Uh, thy kingdom come. That's the second one. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Hallowed be thy name. Hannah, what the heck does that mean? Um, that we should fear, love, and trust God. <laughs> there you go. To, uh, uh, no, that's the commandments. God's name is indeed in itself. There it is. Right. So we pray in this petition. 
that it may be hallowed among us also, right? I don't think I know any more after a minute with Luther than I did a minute before. I still don't know what it means to hallow it. Okay, so I'm not sure what he's talking about with name. I'm not sure what he's talking about with hallow. There is a commandment that, that we could reference, yes? Which commandment deals with the name of the Lord? Number two, no taking the Lord's name in vain, right? So we, so we get a little background going on here, but what, I, what I'm hoping to start um, tuning you into is when you say something as familiar as the Lord's Prayer, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Do you ever stop and say, I don't actually know what that, that's what I'm asking for here, right? Guess what? When you say, and lead us not into temptation, wait till you get a load of what you're asking for when you ask that petition. You might leave that out in the future. <laughs> All right, so without further ado, Kevin, you're our man. Yeah. Um, huh. Well, welcome, everyone. Um, this is uh, going to be an uh, interesting PowerPoint. I, I see my mistake from the get-go now, Dr. Eschelbach. Um, took me over a week now to notice it. But yes, in the name of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Um, as you guys just, you know, I, I added the parentheses, if you didn't notice, because on the sheet, it just said F S. HS. So if you didn't know, I meant Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Just throwing that out there if you didn't know. So um, just filling in some blank. So in Young's Concordance, um, the Father has, uh, you can see it's um, sectioned out and uh, I boxed out the sections that I was referencing and reading and checking out. There's actually a lot to Father and Son um, throughout the Old Testament and the New Testament in Hebrew and Greek. Um, which was a fair amount. So then I was just looking through the other ones, but then those were the main chunks that I read. And then if you look at Holy Spirit, um, the red box, if you guys can zoom in your face to the screen, you guys can see this little red box that was highlighted or boxed out for you. That's Holy Spirit, but that is not what I was look what what was referenced originally or translated originally in in the Bible. It's actually the black box. If you guys can see that black box, black box is what we're looking at. So the black box is Holy Ghost, which is why on the title page it said Holy Spirit with a question mark, because yeah. And then if you go to the next slide, um, when we read it in the NIV ESV. Um, a lot of translations today will say Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. Therefore, go and make disciples um, of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit, um, tends to always say Holy Spirit. And it's really only found in the King James from what I was researching that they use Holy Ghost. Um, why? There really was no explanation. It was just I guess a preference for translators and just kind of generalized it and bunched it all together as Holy Spirit instead of Holy Ghost. Um, could have been something cultural. I don't know. My guess is as good as the next person. Um, actually, I shouldn't. Dr. Eschelbach might have the answer for that. Um, but we'll move on. Um, uh, let me do slide. two things, Kevin. Let me interrupt you. Sorry. But it, oh, this is free. a good Anytime. moment. Number one, um, Ghost in King James in the 16th century is what everybody, that's the word people use when they're thinking about non-material beings. It's a ghost. Coming forward into the 20th century, a ghost is some sort of a, a mythical creature that, um, that Walt Disney came up with and it flies around on Halloween. So English translators did not want people to be thinking about um, sheets with holes cut in it on a Charlie Brown cartoon when they read the Bible. So that's why they abandoned ghost and went with spirit. It also came out of the hymnals too. The old hymnals had Holy Ghost and that in coming forward, it was the Holy Spirit. Now, just intuitively speaking and going forward, friends, if I, if I give you a passage and, and you're thinking that what I want you to do a word search on is 
is not just one word, not two words, but three words that occur like a million times, that's probably not what I wanted you to look at. I'm not, I don't want to be cruel here. <laughs> uh, Kevin, you're not married though, right? I am not. So you have tons and you have nothing but time. So I did assign you this on purpose to even things up with your classmates, <laughs> but that's okay. Um, Kevin, 10 minutes wise, you, you could probably, I do want you to share with us what you learned, but you could probably fast track to the, to the in the name part if, as, as you please, but I'll leave that to your discretion. Um, so father, it's uh, written in three different ways that the Bible, Old Testament has two ways and means the father or father um father as a father an ancestor a source or an inventor um and the way that father is mentioned a lot is through genealogy and um the father of so-and-so and father father um and uh the new testament only has one meaning which means father or ancestor it's written only in one way um father is a title new testament reveals the heavenly father um and the and yeah, so when the New Testament, when it comes to the New Testament, a lot of times it speaks of the Father. It really speaks of the Heavenly Father, the one who's above, the one who sent Jesus, the one who has a plan, the one who is orchestrating what is going on. And um, that's kind of how Father is more, more often than not referenced throughout the New Testament compared to the Old Testament, where Old Testament, it could be a father of whoever, it could be a father of someone, genealogy, or this is the father. But again, New Testament switches to our heavenly father, more or less. That's actually really good work, Kevin. Thank you for that. And then son, um, it, there was a lot to son. And in the same way, it was like a lot of genealogy of like, this is the son of. And um, But I did find this one interesting. Um, when you look in the index uh, for son, it gives you child full son and son and then um but son of man equals christ and the one um sent by the father but uh in this verse of matthew 21 5 full is still that same uh reference that i i just thought it was a fun read um <laughs> tell ye the daughter of sion behold thy king cometh unto thee meek and sitting upon an ass yeah hey he highlighted it the cult of the full of an ass I'm crossing uh, it out. It's profane. Oh, oh, sorry. Oh, was I supposed to skip that part? Apologies. Um, but uh, the full, like, it, it was just interesting that they would still put that one or full and like connect that to sun and not use sun. Um, full is like this animal. It's a horse, like a, a baby horse. Um, mm -hmm. So if you're someone who grew up outside of California and no animals, that's yeah just yeah um full animal yep um so holy holy ghost holy spirit um this was interesting actually i found this one interesting because in all the other in father son and actually a bunch of words there were a few other words that i was looking through the young's concordance and like they they gave every word pretty much like has the bible verse and then a snippet of what they're trying to get at the Holy Spirit, along with a handful of other words that I found, um, only gave Bible verses, did not list out. And Dr. Ashwabach could tell us why, probably. I don't know why, but there's a handful of words on, on um, what they had. But so for the most part, these were all the verses that had Holy Ghost mentioned. Um, and it was... Um, it's pretty much, yeah, um, it just talks about the Holy Spirit and the one that is to come, the one sent by Jesus, the one who is in us, fills us, the one who um, empowers believers. Um, I think that is, um, that is what all these verses, I mean, it tells us who the Holy Spirit is and what the point of the Holy Spirit is or what the Holy Spirit does and how the Holy Spirit operates and works in this world. Yeah. Um, to answer your question, it, when, when there's a word that occurs so many times, they try and actually help you um, by only including text where there's something new. 
for you to know by way of a text. So you can assume that the other passages with no text are just telling you things that you've already seen in a text they provided. It's for efficiency. And then Holy Spirit, it is for some reason separate, Holy Ghost and Holy Spirit. Um, it is separated and um, there are, these are the verses of the Holy Spirit. There's only four times it's referenced. And um, I found Ephesians 4.20 interesting because it doesn't actually say Holy Spirit, but it's pointing to the Holy Spirit without saying it. So um, that was a little bit of a fascinating find. Um, and yeah, we can go on to the next one. So Holy Ghost and Holy Spirit. Uh, like I said earlier, the one who empowers, guides, and leads, and is sent by the Father, living in this world, active, and then it is the one that gives, speaks through us. Um, and there is really no difference between Holy Spirit and Holy Ghost. They are both referencing part of the Trinity. Um, now, for this, I, I, I understand now like I said from the get-go that what um, straight to Father, Son, Son, and Holy Spirit, but in the name of, um, it is the one who sends, it is the one who we go um, in the name, I mean, who we, who we represent, who we are ambassadors of, the ones who we do this work on behalf of, and um, even more so, it's the one, yeah, who sends, and um, yeah, I think uh, it's, I thought it was just researching the Trinity and looking up all these verses on Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, but in the name of. Um, so I must apologize. I didn't realize it was in the name of, that was the important part. And I do, yes, that that's the one who sends us in each part of. Trinity is important. The Trinity is great. The Trinity is the Trinity. <laughs> and uh, each part of the Trinity works together in their individual roles. And yeah, but um, overall, uh, I missed the whole in the name of. Daniel, are you feeling better? Yes, yeah, see? That's a good thing, Kevin. Kevin, tell us, um, can you replace the phrase in the name of for us in that verse? So here we go. I'm going to come up to your part. Go you there. Jesus said, go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them. What, what should we say, Kevin? What should we think? By the power of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. Not bad. That's, that is actually pretty decent. Notice it's not a location issue then in the name of. Kevin is using the instrumental use of the word by, by the. And then name power. has something to do with the power of God. That's going to be okay, Kevin. You just redeemed yourself. Yes. <laughs> okay. So, to look at the whole verse with you, okay, um, first of all, there's no imperative to go as you go about. So, I didn't give Kevin the whole verse. I just said, gave him that phrase in the name of Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Um, so, this is actually a, a problem because um, in the 20th century, um, there was a lot of um, interest in mission work, and, and the first assumption that was, was misplaced is that you have to go someplace far away, someplace else, um, in order to do mission work. Um, and that's not what Jesus said. And quite the contrary. This is, this is like wherever your life takes you, that's the point. You're always an ambassador. You're always going to be making disciples. So that's the imperative, make disciples. And that's the only imperative. There's no imperative to baptize. There's no imperative to teach. Okay. So as you go about as a participle, that just is a sort of an attendant circumstance. Now what we get to is how do you make disciples? What does that look like? And it happens this way by, now you're used to hearing baptizing them, but let's think about what that means in English, by immersing them in the word. So the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, like that first petition of the Lord's Prayer, is a reference to his word. So we're going to immerse people in the word of God, in his will, in his ways, 
right? Every, all of the revelation of God to us, we're going to immerse people in that. How do I know that I'm on the right track? It's and. The and is exegetical. It's not two different things. Splash water on people and teach them what I taught you in, as in a, a very narrowly confined moment. But think about how this worked out historically. After the time of Luther, what happened in the Lutheran church? People brought their babies to be baptized and then went home again for about 13 years, brought them back for a 10 or 12 or 15 weeks of confirmation class, done. That's it. See you again when I get married. I'll see you again when I need to be buried. That's how this text was understood. Very, very narrowly confined and very formal in its application. That's not what Jesus said. And, and so, exegetically speaking, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, what does that mean? It means teaching them, and the teaching there is an emphasis on the ongoing, like this is a constant, teaching them to observe everything that I've commanded you, which is all of Scripture, which includes Scriptures that point you to natural revelation in nature, Reason, logic, understanding, all means that God has provided for us. And notice, in so doing, if you are immersed in God's revelation to you, could, could Jesus be absent? Right? That's not possible. So that's how it comes to be that Jesus is with you always. Very different, um, if you can create a mental image, right? Very different than what most people's experiences in, in Christian churches in general and in the Lutheran churches in particular, right? My, my, the church I grew up with, uh, Lutheran Church in Ann Arbor, Michigan, never ever that I remember had adult Bible classes. Like why, what's that for, right? We don't need that. I, I went to confirmation class when I was 13. I, I got it and we're on our way. Okay, questions? Oh yeah, Corey. Yeah, uh, just a question on the whole ep exegetical thing, because yes. um, because what you're saying makes a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. um, but how do we how do we know? So like, is it very clear in the Greek that it is this way, or okay. no? In in so in this case, Corey, it's a great question because Greek does not give you any advantage. What you can do is always try first ep exegetical when you see an and. Let me see if that works. Does it? Does it seem to make sense like the, um, like the wise men came in and fell down before Jesus and worshiped him? Are those two different things or is it the same thing? If they're two different things, you'll tend to notice that right away. For example, the wise men fell down, that is to say, they worshiped Jesus and they offered him gifts. Those are two different things, right? Falling down, offering gifts, different. Gold and frankincense and myrrh. So just think in your head, is it a plus sign or an equal sign? And you can have a conversation about it, right? So, yeah. Corey, nobody goes to hell for saying it was exegetical if it wasn't. You can be wrong about that. <laughs> but that's a great question. Okay, Nathan, you're up. All righty. So uh, I forgot to put the question on that, but it's in my name question. And the reference I actually had, because I apparently didn't get the update, was just Matthew 18. So this is how I went about exploring uh, this, this uh, phrase and uh, using Matthew 18. So if we go to the next slide. So I went ahead and just automatically looked into Young's Concordance, we're supposed to do. Uh, notice that the name is on, uh, on, Onama in the Greek, and it's uh, it's there 193 times just that that name in the Greek. And so I took a little graphic from the uh, logos just to kind of show you the other parts of the name that also show up it with the Greek in it as well. So then uh, looking at the definition here, it says it's a, obviously it's a noun that's re referring to either being or uh, God understanding by their name, perhaps understood according to the uh, reputation or the character of this person. So I'll get to that. 
but I went and started looking at Matthew 18. So if we go on to the next slide and all of Matthew 18, which is actually pretty lengthy. Um, this is, I believe, right after Jesus gets off the mountain with the three other disciples and the other ones are arguing about stuff and he being Jesus already knows what's going on. So they're asking who is the greatest and going over that little section. Uh, then he talks about the temptations to sin, uh, the parable of the lost sheep, which we all know that one pretty well. Uh, it's your brother sins against you what to do in those situations and the parable of the unforgiving servant. So <laughs> a lot of, a lot of issues with sin, a lot of law in this whole section. So uh, so I was trying to, pry, again, looking at the context of Matthew 18, trying to figure out where this word fits in. So if we go to the next slide, uh, it, the word in my name only shows up twice in Matthew 18. And this is in the King James, it's whoever shall receive one such a little child of my name receiveth me. And then the other one is where two or three are gathered together in my name. There I am in the midst of them. So just kind of looking at those two, and they're both kind of similar, but I, they're, I'll, and again, I'll show you here towards the end what I kind of figured out, or at least where I went with these two different passages. Uh, but I wanted to, again, look at it a little bit bigger. So if we go to the next slide, I was looking at the reference, like, what is it? Okay, because there's a little bit more here. So when Jesus is talking about uh, these little children, which are uh, probably had some children around him, uh, whoever causes one of them to sin, it'd be better for him to throw uh, with a uh, to have a great millstone fast around his neck and be drowned in the depth of the sea. So uh, it's taking, obviously it's causing somebody to sin, even if you're using the name in my name, and I'll get to that here in a second. Um, there's consequences of that. Uh, well, at least Jesus is saying that, not that you maybe literally do that. Uh, and then going down to the other one, he talks about, oops, hold on. Uh, if two agree on earth about anything, it's asked in my name, which uh, uh, Professor Al Shabak talked a little bit about that actually today a little too. Um, then it goes on to the next part where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am among them. So I underline those things because I believe these obviously are associated with in my name. There's something going on with in my name with those different references in those passages. Uh, so I wanted to know a little bit more about the name, which you probably know. So if you go to the next slide, um, I looked up because this was in my section of names is uh, in Matthew 1 where Jesus is given the name of Jesus and that his name will be called Emmanuel, and there's some other names given to him. So I highlighted it, by the way, just so everybody knows, I'm not an, a University of Oregon Duck fan. I'm not at all. I just chose yellow and green to highlight the differences. So please don't assume I'm an Oregon Duck because I'm from Oregon. Uh, anyway, so, so yeah, so his name is Jesus. So we know that's what it's referring to in, those, in that passage in those verses. So I decided to explore it some more. So if we go to the next slide before i do um hey friends actually what nathan was doing without having a particular verse to focus on is you this was exactly what should happen you're looking around in the whole chapter you you find the phrase you get the larger context that the fact that you found these these two references in matthew having to do with the name of jesus is significance does everybody out there know what jesus means Salvation is from the Lord, right? Yeshua, okay? Emmanuel, so um, Hebrew also, God is with us. Now, one thing that we lose track of, sorry to interrupt, Nathan, but this is, it's, you, you got us going on something that's important, so that's well done. In ancient times, when people called each other by name, they would not have heard what we hear or what we think we hear when we when we talk to each other. Okay. If your name was Adam and your mother was calling you, you'd not, you wouldn't hear the word Adam. You would hear her saying, dirt. Dirt, it's time to say goodbye to your friends and come into the house. Right. When people talked about Jesus. Or when the angel said, this is Jesus' name, the, the people didn't hear Jesus. What they heard was, salvation is from the Lord. And so that's another place where English translations are doing us all a disservice, especially you, because you don't get to hear what the original audience heard. So if you went through the Old and New Testaments and replaced the word 
Yeshua or Joshua or Jesus, everywhere that occurs, replace it with the phrase salvation is of the Lord, would you be surprised what happens to your reading? It would begin to take on a whole different, same thing with Emmanuel. Jesus' name wasn't Emmanuel. Jesus' name was God with us. So immediately, the, the nature of Jesus is obvious by, by these names that he bears. But in English, that's lost because they're very inconsistent in their translating. Okay, thanks for a great moment there, Nathan. Uh, keep going. You're doing yeah. great. Yeah. When I thought about talking about that, because I know that uh, the name of God wasn't uttered much in the Old Testament. It was, re you know, had reverence and so on. Right. I thought about focusing there, but I, I think there's a connection with obviously in the in this phrase here. So I, I decided just kind of st uh, to stay with that. So, so anyway, within the 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 verses that this fell under the Matthew 18, I looked at some of the other passages and a lot of times the name was just used as in his name is john or something not in his name and some of these as you see here in matthew or yeah matthew 7 it's uh it says in your name uh as well as in matthew 10 for your name's sake so it's kind of there uh, mm -hmm. but the part i'm looking at is what's on going on around it so it talks about that many of the lord will be prophesying in your name and cast out demons in your name and doing mighty works in your name question mark so there's something going on with around that 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 the the phrase there in your name uh so uh, hold on i got i got a lot of these mixed up in my head here so some of these aren't necessarily a positive thing too as we saw in the in the um matthew 18 5 and 20 there's something going on so brother uh, so number 10 is uh talks about if you're hated by others for my name's sake so this is in a sense something good because uh, we're doing it for Jesus' name, but there's something bad happening to the individual because of uh, of the name of Jesus. And then going down to Matthew 12 there at the bottom, in my name, uh, the Gentiles will um, will hope. And so this is, again, something positive, just again, looking around those verses. So some of these kind of fit some a little bit. So if we go to the next slide, I think I've found, looked at some more of these. Uh, so this is Matthew 19. Um, Unless his house brother's sister for my name's sake will receive a hundredfold will inherit eternal life. So this is something positive again uh, in the namesake of Jesus. Uh, for many will in my name be saying I'm the Christ and they will uh, lead many astray. So now the, the in my name is not being used in a, a very positive sense. Obviously it's causing sin by others being led astray. And then uh, down there at Matthew 24, 9, then they will deliver you up to tribulation, put you to death, and they will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. So even though we're doing something positive, not necessarily positive, we're, we're being asked by, you know, Christ for his followers, others will will in, in, um, will be causing harm or, you know, what a, a, something negative to happen to us as well. So if we go to the next slide, I'm trying to remember how many of these did. So again, you can kind of start to see other places where, uh, that his name is being used uh, or something's going to be happen because of his name. And again, it's not so much in my name, but that, that, that's, that phrase is kind of still there. Uh, I think I've got one more. Hold on a second. I might've gone too far too quick because one of these, yeah. So hold on to remember this. So, uh, Teacher, the, the, the Mark 9 there says, teacher, you saw some uh, someone cast out demons in your name. We tried to stop them because they weren't following us. But Jesus said, do not stop him for the one who does mighty work in my name will be uh, will be soon afterward to speak uh, evil of me. Did I read that right? Yeah, um, there should. There's a not missing. Oh, it's, it's no one. No, no one. There is. Sorry. Reason. Yeah. Sorry, I'm nervous. I skipped over it. Yeah. Right. So hold on to that because I'm coming back to that. So if we go to the next one. Again, just more uses of, of the kind of the same thing of his name or on the name, in the name, uh, not necessarily in my name as a reference, because I believe all these these are more of the, the epistles, the writings, mm -hmm. not so much the gospels where Jesus is actually speaking, but the disciples are still referencing mm -hmm. that name part. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, so I thought they're worth looking at. And again, the context of it is some of these things are positive things that happen. Other times it's something's going to happen or we're misusing it. Uh, so if we go to the next one, because we're getting close to my my point here. Yeah, let, let me pause a minute, because sure. you reminded me of something. This came up in my conversation with Carol Ann earlier this week. If you 
if you're working on a word, whether it's whether I assigned it to you or not, if you're working on a word in Young's and it has a vast amount of references, then there's a strategy to working through them. Okay, the first, the first thing you do is look at the other references in the book of the Bible that you're working on, right, from nearest to, to more, more distant. So if you're looking at a word, your references in Matthew 18, then look, at, look for where your word occurs in Matthew 17, Matthew 19, Matthew 16. Just work your way out, okay, until your time is up, and then keep going. Um, if you have time and you're and you're in a gospel, then go to the other gospels. If you're in a Pauline epistle, then go to the other Pauline epistles. If you're in Peter, both Peter's and Mark, because the same author, right? In Old Testament, same thing. So you just sort of work your way out from what's most like your passage to what to to what the whole spectrum is, and that will help you uh, know how to devote your time. Okay. So this is where it's I started to kind of narrow it down. What does it mean in my name? And so the again, the Matthew uh, five and the 20 there, when again referencing the child if we're doing something on and saying in you know, on, on in my name, and yet we cause them the sin, it's it's you know not not so much a good thing. And then the gathering of uh with two or three are gathered in my name among them, uh there that's you know an positive thing, something that we're, we're called to do. And I noticed in Mark, I had a similar scenario where the, where the you know, the disciples are saying, hey, wait, this, this person's doing this in your name. He's not us. And then understanding what it means. That, no, he's doing it in my name. Don't stop him. Uh, you know, this is this is a good thing. And so recognizing the, the importance of the name. So go to the last slide. This is what I feel like. Uh, this is what I'm trying to answer here is that this is an action that as Christians, we we have the name of Jesus. And if we're not doing, and not that we're all perfect in any means, and not that we are the best examples, uh, but if we're doing things in the name of Jesus, that isn't what is, God has called or asked us to do, I would say this is something that is bad. But also recognizing because of his name, and I think a lot of us know this these days, you call yourself a Christian or even a Jesus follower, automatically puts walls up between individuals in our society because you're seen as a, a bad thing because of uh, anyway just misunderstanding so i think what we have to look at is when we're using the name in my name that we are we're we're called to do the things that god has asked us to do uh, and being conscious again of what we're doing with those individuals around us so that's where i kind of focus down what is it in my name Good. And it's all, um, all of the verse passages you looked at yielded some learning and some understanding for you. And you came out with, with, with what you just shared with us. That's all beneficial. One last thing then, Nathan, and then we'll take a break, is replace the phrase. So if you're not allowed to say the phrase in my name, what would you replace it with? Uh, in my teachings. Okay, replace in. Uh, with? With my teaching. How about according to? According to my teachings. Yeah. Okay, we're just taking that out for a spin. Uh, but like you did with words, in a word study, see if you can replace the word. And it's okay if it's a phrase. It's okay if it's a sentence or a paragraph. Whatever it takes to accurately replace the word with what the word is intending and then and then you can try it in different passages and see if it's if that's making sense if it actually if you got it uh and that's helpful or if you don't quite have it and and we need to keep working on it so well done uh everybody five minutes or so and we'll come back and and get going with kingston
All right. I'm back, friends. If you can hear me, come on back, and we'll um, as soon as you can, we'll get started with the ever enviable Kingston approach to a, to fulfilling the assignment. <laughs> There's Kingston with a big smile. Yay. Uh, you know what? Oh, I have to do something to make this work. I just realized. Yeah, okay. All right, here it goes. Uh-oh, I got a pro, hang on. I got a little technical difficulty here. Good evening, friends. There we go. For my word study, the word that was given to me is name. Name, to be precise, the phrase, in my name, John 16, 23. So when we see in this verse, it goes like this. And in that day, ye shall ask, me nothing. Worldly, worldly, I say unto you, whatsoever you ask the Father in my name, he will give it to you. Whatsoever he shall ask the Father in my name, he will give it to you. So it's very simple verse and straightforward verse. We all know that whatever we ask, it shall be given. So we know that ask, it shall be given unto you. So when I start looking further, uh, the definition of this word, it goes like this. A word or a place carry more importance or value in biblical than in modern day, modern view. You know, when Bible says our name, it has more significance. Like Jesus, we all know that the name significant. Then uh, the name emphasize savior. Like that every place, a place named Maram, we know it's bitterness. So name gives the meaning. So it's more important to zoom down to the name why Jesus says, ask in my name. So when I look for the reference in Young's concurrence, I see in the backside, as I showed, the Greek word is called Onoma, Onoma, and they have listed a lot. So as I have mentioned, they have listed a lot. It, it's called name, named, called, and with the dative, and so many things, and a lot of things I don't understand. So I request professor to explain on that. So the name occurs 193 times, and in the meaning of called, it is three times. And in the named, it comes 24 times. And when I go back to the 193 times, which is listed down, I see various verses that are so related. And then when I read it, I zoom down to the meaning of authority. I see the word, the, the verse, emphasize on authority. Mm. So this diagram, I took it from Logos. It, though it branches out so much, the highlight is authority. Mm -hmm. So when I go through all those things, I started um, to go for the reference. Then I started searching for the reference in the name of Jesus, in my name. So when I started that, seeing that, I went through a lot of things. I'm listing it here, which says a uh, lot of relevant verses. You call in my name and I will answer. And then finally, in those, I zoom down to a meaning. In the name of Christ, see, the name of Jesus Christ is very powerful. Name above all names. Mm -hmm. And every knee shall bow and every tongue comes first. So that name is very important. So 
miracles are performed in that name repentance is in that name justification is in the, in the name of jesus whenever we say thanks thankfulness everything comes in the name of jesus so the name of jesus is where the authority is and it it is power and god has given us that power to use his name as a child of god and again coming back to john 16:23 it says whatsoever you ask the father in my name he will give you so let me put a small question here whatsoever whatsoever you want and that means when bible says your heart's desire will be given so if i'm going to ask okay i want to be a millionaire overnight in jesus name will it happen or not so definitely there are unanswered prayers in your life and i in my life we all agree in that and we have sincerely prayed for that and those things never came to pass and why but when this verse says that ask in his name you will get but sometimes you don't get so what is the relationship in that gap why is there is the why there is a gap so let me i was just pondering on more and i i came to this verse john 2 4 we all know this the wedding at cana so there jesus himself says the answer why do you ask sometimes you don't get it so here uh, mary mother of jesus goes and ask jesus but it's not happening but jesus gives the answer my hour is not yet come my time has not yet come so the time of god is very important bible says at when the time was right jesus came to earth so god's timing is very important so we all know that in his time he makes things perfect so one thing is time and another thing is the will of god in john 1 john chapter 5 was 14 to 15 when we see that here also god says that whatsoever we ask it shall be given whatsoever we ask it shall be given but it says that when we ask according to his will so when his will and when our desire comes together god gives them so god's time god's will makes things happen so how to understand this verse john 16 23 whatsoever you ask the father in my name in his name if we ask at the right time at the with the name of jesus with this will and with this time it happens and i hope we have decoded this rightly and professor can explain it further but i want to add on a small incident from my life which i put like out of syllabus this is extra i don't know whether it relates with this or not i will take 2 minutes and finish it up <laughs> god speaks to us said universal truth jesus is, god, uh, jesus can speak to us communicate to us we all know that and he listen he speaks when we listen that's the second thing when we are ready to listen he speaks and when we obey he and listen when we listen and obey he definitely speaks i want to quote this verse isaiah 30 21 and thine ears shall hear a word behind saying that this is the way walk in it turn to the right turn to the left the god guides us in my life i have experienced this verse very very um, supernaturally 20 years back when i got married i met my wife first time my parents took me it's a arranged marriage so my parents took me to her house we all i saw my wife first time at that time there were so many thoughts in my mind but god spoke to me literally he spoke to me i heard a voice it's not an audible voice it's directly in my heart saying that don't tell anything other than yes <laughs> so i told yes i will marry her mm-hmm. that's the first day i am saying uh, it's our culture so in two months we got married and we are 20 years now of married life we don't have any regret god can speak to us so personally and i have experienced this it's not only one incidents lot of things in my life i can say that god speaks when we listen and he speaks when we listen and obey and whenever we ask he is there to speak to us 
show us the way our unknown future is secured in god's hand thank you beautiful thank you kingston nicely done um, friends, I don't, it, the beauty of uh, pre-recording is that if you don't like how it turned out, you can do it again and again and again. Um, but that tends not to be how Bible class works and is sure not how preaching works. Um, so there's something to being live as well, but both are good. Two points uh, to make um, with reference to what Kingston shared with us. Number one, arranged marriages. Bet you didn't see that coming, Kevin. <laughs> okay what if i told you all all marriages are arranged marriages it's just a question of who's doing the arranging and and we might suspect that um the parents of children might do a better job in terms of accuracy than the children do in other words i know my children better than they know themselves and if i i was um in conversation with another set of parents and that was true there may be a greater likelihood of happiness uh, because of perspective. But just also as an aside, I uh, just arranged a marriage today. I have a, a student that graduated a year ago and another student who's graduating this May. And I was thinking, you know what? Uh, that looks like a match to me. So I introduced them this morning uh, to each other and uh, expect to see a wedding announcement soon. I'll keep you posted. I have done this before, though. I have two previous two marriages coming out of River Forest that uh, still going strong. Um, the other thing, though, notice um, that more practically speaking to is um, research. So you're working with the phrase in my name. That's what you're trying to figure out. But Young's maybe isn't that important, uh, uh, helpful in all of those different contexts. And Nathan showed us a ton of them. Does it is it really helping you? get your mind around what that phrase means, actually the in the name part. And Nathan did get there um, very commendably. Notice what Kingston did. He backed up a word, ask. If you ask anything in my name, he will do it. So what happens if we pursue, so you look up in Young's, what's the word for ask that's being used there? Where else does that occur in the New Testament? When was the request granted and when wasn't it? Do you notice that? Super important insight there. Well done, Kingston. As they said, it's a sort of a Sherlock Holmes thing, is that maybe the answer to our question isn't in the phrase itself, but I have to look at the context that the phrase occurs in and look at similar contexts and see if that helps me figure out what's going on with the phrase. Really well done. So if you noticed in each, each of these cases, Matthew 28, Matthew 18, and John 16, there's a kind of a question hanging out there. What does it actually mean to baptize someone in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost? What does it mean? Um, and, and, uh, and Nathan took the earlier, uh, the, the verse 5, uh, occurrence of in my name. I was thinking about the verse 20. By the way, did all of you, I thought that I sent an updated schedule to you. And in that schedule, I was careful to put a verse. If I had only put a chapter, I went back and added a verse. Um, should I send you that schedule again? Yeah, I'm getting heads nodding. All right, I'll send you the, the new schedule so you're not sifting through a whole chapter. Um, but Jesus in, in that in verse 20 says, wherever two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst. So what does that mean? How does that work? Is it a Harry Potter sort of a thing where you say in my name and you sprinkle salt around in a circle and hop up and down a couple times and then Jesus appears? Or is it more obvious than that? So if in my name is referring, for example, to the Bible, Wherever two or three of you gather together in the midst of his word, you're listening to his word. How could he not be in the midst? So something like that. Okay, nicely done. Let's go on. I put um, his slides in here just in case we needed them. Um, and now, okay, uh, a little commercial for Young's here. Um, I was 
actually in, the, in my PhD work in graduate school, before I started reading the introductions to books, that's an embarrassing thing for me to admit. Um, but but it, I've discovered that there's a lot of super helpful information in the introductions of books, as, and I learned that in part in writing my own. Um, in Young's Concordance in the front, there's this little paragraph, the essential quality of names. And so here's actually one paragraph that's saying pretty much what we learned from Kevin, Nathan, and Kingston. Worth having a look in other places in Young's besides just for the word. Um, I'm going to come back to this because I want to get on to Daniel. Da <laughs> Daniel was looking at this assignment and I'm not sure what to do with it. So I said, well, would you rather have a different assignment? Yes, please. <laughs> so this is what Daniel's working on with authority, taught with authority. That's his phrase. Daniel, if you please. Okay. Uh, I think it's the next slide. So if you want to. Yeah. So this is my 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 uh, my word was uh, taught with authority. Mark one twenty two, uh, and the verses I, I'll just read the ES, ESV version, and they were astonished at his teachings, for he taught them as one who had authority and not as the scribes. Yeah, this this is just me. Just this is how I kind of start with my scripture. I just kind of get an idea of the the text, and so I kind of go before the text, the Mark uh, chapter Mark. And so this is, if, if you if you know the book of Mark, right? It starts right after Je uh, Jesus was baptized, and then uh, and then goes on his way. And so that was just to kind of give me good context of where I'm picking up the my verse. And Jesus is, you know. Um, he goes and grabs his uh, first few um, uh, disciples, right? Simon, Peter, um, Andrew, James, and John. And then the text comes and he's, he's continuing going on and he goes into a town called Capernaum. And then that's where Jesus goes into the synagogue and preaches. And that's where the text uh, picks up is that there Jesus was, people were astonished because Jesus taught with authority and not like the scribes. And then after the text, Jesus goes out. If you, if, you know, if you remember the story, Jesus goes out and casts out a demon from a man who visits the synagogue. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, I, I look up the word taught. It was a simple word, right? So I'll just throw it out there. I won't say too much about it. It's just, I mean, the Greek word is didasko, to teach. And these are just the verses about taught. And basically, it's just to teach. All right. Authority. That's the uh, occurrence in, in concordance of 30, 63 times. Exousia, right? Privilege, authority. The index was 71 times. And then uh, there's the, you know, some of the um, uh, uh, where authority came out, right? 29 times jurisdiction, liberty, power, right, and then strength. And then the next one is um, where I get into the verses. This is kind of where I spent most of the time is just going through the verses and the, the authority. Um, you know, the first one is he taught them as one having an authority. And this was um, where, oh, yeah, this is where Jesus just finished on the, the Sermon on the Mount, right? Um, and then um, he was teaching. Yeah, hopefully I don't get all my uh, verses mixed up. And then the next one is Mark where he. He gave the, these he gave the, these authorities to do right and this, so this is when Jesus, it was Palm Sunday Jesus goes down um, he heals the blind man um, he goes and clears that this is where he flips over the markets that clears those t tables and stuff he enters the uh, the he enters Jerusalem and then he goes and preaches and then the priest kind of says they question his authority that's when that's the other usage of that mm -hmm. uh, the next verse is he. I would tell you by what authority I do, right? And so this is where it's it's Palm Sunday too, and it's it's kind of continuing on the same uh, story as the Mark eleven, where uh, they're questioning his authority, right? The high priest, and then they're, they're thinking about it. They they're like, well, you know, if if we if we agree with John, right, the Baptist, right, because uh, then if that he was sent from heaven, then uh, we'll have to believe in him, and then um, if we don't think he was sent for him, then he's a prophet, right? And so so they decided, no, we, we're not going to tell you. So Jesus said, 
just kind of said, no, I'm not going to tell you too, right? I'm not, I would not tell you what authority I get it from. And then Luke is, um, with authority and power, he commandeth, right? Um, and so this is just right after the 40-day uh, temptation. He goes into the synagogue in Capernaum. And this is kind of where he sees that demon-possessed man. And then um, Jesus tells the demon to kind of be, be silent, be quiet, and leave the, leave the man. And so people kind of heard that and say, well, his, his word has authority, commands the evil spirit. Uh, and then the next one is um, he gave them power and authority. So this is uh, he, this is when he sent out the disciples to go to each town and town, right? And Jesus said, go out there and have the authority to um, to preach and um, uh, heal people, right? And so uh, th th this is at the same time when John the Baptist was beheaded too. So after that, the, after he fed, and then it was the fight feeding the five thousand. After that. The disciples came back and they kind of told Jesus about all of the things they did with the uh, authority that he had, they, that he gave them. Uh, and Acts, this is, this is now we're getting into Paul, right? The story of Paul, where Paul goes out and, um, and uh, does all these uh, um, to the Jews, right? And so, so the question for him was, uh, who's authority? And there was the uh, high chief priest that gave him the authority. So that's more of a legal authority. And then uh, the next one was uh, same thing with Paul, right? I've given him authority to execute. I think it was Paul. This was when, no, it was, oh, this was Jesus, right? And so this this is talking about Jesus. Uh, same thing, same issue. I mean, same conversation as the high priest. And he even called God his father, right? Making him equal to God. And then here Jesus was, uh, talks about authority. And then and in, in here it talks about, Jesus has the authority to execute judgment, right, on people. Um, Acts, this is the same thing with Paul. And I think this is a little bit later on with Paul, where Paul was uh, in prison, right? And he was he wanted to go see, see uh, Caesar, right? And then so there's this King Agrippa comes and says, well, I got to hear him, right? So he goes and listens to Paul. And, um, and Paul's saying the same thing. He was given the authority from the high priest to do... Um, he didn't commit any crime with the Jews, right? And so he was given the authority from the high priest for whatever he did. And the last one's Matthew 13, 54. Uh, this is just his wisdom, mighty works. And so Jesus returns to Nazareth uh, and doing the same thing as he does, teaching at synagogues. And the people were astonished where he got his wisdom and mighty works. Uh, Daniel, I'm going to underline here the Luke 4:36. Yeah. And here's Luke 9, verse 1. What kind of a and is that? Is it a plus sign or an equal sign? Plus, right? Is it? Oh, equal sign. Right? right. So yeah. there, there you found you found a couple of passages where you might have recognized right away. There's the answer to your question. Teaching with authority means teaching with the power. Uh, and then and then we can think about what's the nature of that power is it power because his words accomplish what they what what they describe like isaiah 55 talks about is it power in terms of clarity the power of the language itself what's meant and what's understood is it power of the, the inspired word the holy spirit is present with the word or is it all three so that's a that's a tangent we could take that but this, that's a good jumping off point there okay right. keep going yeah uh so this is just organizing my thoughts i just kind of put it together right given authority by someone that was kind of the just uh god gave him authority that was the damascus stuff right all and then having power and mighty works right uh dr he talked about that and then the other thing was just i i kind of saw it as maybe just owning right? The scripture and kind of, that's where I saw them, mm -hmm. um, Matthew. And so I kind of see, I see the word, the use of the authority as kind of that legal power, having the mighty power, right? From God mm -hmm. and just owning it in the process. Mm -hmm. And so, mm -hmm. so, so, I mean, I'll, so in, in the context, I kind of just, you know, how does this using the word authority make sense to me? And so uh, we're a soccer family, right? And we have 
we raised our, our kid played one of my, my oldest son played kind of in the competitive premier soccer. And I remember at that time when it was around the 12, the 13 age range, the coaches would kind of make those comments in the training. You, you sit there in your chairs and you're watching soccer five days a week. Right. And the coaches would go, you got to play with authority right on the field. And the kids are kind of, in, if you don't understand soccer, there's a, this 2020 grid where the kids kind of control and the coaches are telling them to play with authority. And you kind of think about that. What does that mean when they play with authority? And then, and then we all know, right, the goat of all football, when we've seen them play in the championship games and Super Bowls and kind of those drives that he goes down and he plays with authority or he's, he really takes control of the game. So, mm-hmm. so that's kind of how I understood the word authority is just, Having the having that presence, on whatever you're doing. Right. Yeah, good. Um, that word owning the process, right? All of you have had classes with a teachers or professors who did not yet own the subject they were teaching, <laughs> and you've had classes with professors or teachers who did own the subject, right? You know the difference. Uh, Similarly, um, you could see someone uh, play an instrument, right? Some instrumentalists own the instrument. It works for them. And others are still trying to, the the instrument's still too much for them. (laughs) They don't own it. Okay. So this is is where I landed. Jesus taught with with power and not like the scribes, right? And Mm -hmm. then Jesus taught like he owns the teaching and not like the scribes. Or Jesus taught like he wrote the teaching and not like the scribes are kind of the end there jesus taught like he was given full control over teaching and not like the scribes there's the and there's the timer is that is this your last slide nicely done daniel Whew. okay well done good and um let's keep going then uh uma awesome sauce let's do this first <laughs> of all i uh, just want to recognize that we have a sus amongst us has been silently watching and listening. So hi there. Um, also, uh, let's do this. <laughs> so, oh, sorry. My uh, word was actually uh, put my trust in on my phrase study from Psalms 7-2. There we go. Okay. So I'm just going to quickly read this uh, first five verses because I kind of lends into our chat. So, oh, Lord, my God, in thee do I put my trust. Save me from all of them that persecute me and deliver me. Least he tears my soul like a lion, rendering it in pieces while there is none to deliver. Oh, Lord, my God, if I had done this, if if there be iniquities in my hands, if I have rewarded evil unto him that was at peace with me. And we can read the rest. But so what, what is this saying? So one of the things that I... I took from this was two things. Number one was, uh, in thee do I put my trust. What is this trust about? What And who is it referencing to? And who's in relationship with the trust? And the word trust really, uh, for me, was like, sem- uh, seemed transactional. There's a transaction between uh, the individual and who they're putting their trust. Uh, there is an assurance or uh, whatever, something that I put my trust in. So that's where I started going with my chat. Next slide, sir. So I found four verses and this uh, four different translations. And this particular translation used a different word, which really threw me off for a loop. So, oh, Lord, my God, in you, I take refuge. Save me from all my persecutor persecu- pursuers and deliver me all like a lion, they'll tear me apart, they'll drag me away with no one to rescue, oh Lord my God, and so forth. And this word really stuck to me because as someone who lived as a refugee for four years during the war, this had a totally different meaning to the entire context of this particular passage than the previous one from James, uh, from the, uh, the other version. So I found two other versions, um next slide sir oh sorry <laughs> no worries and so in this one the niv it goes back to the word trust except it changes some of the uh pre-words uh, as opposed to in these it's in you i put my trust so lord my god in you i have put my trust and again 
it is making a reference to the relationship between the individual and who God is, and if God is worthy of my trust, or is God um, is God a oh, oh Lord? Is are they um, are they needing to prove that my trust is worth put, placing in them, right? And so I looked at another translation, and and that. NSRV, I think the next one. Oh no, ASV. Um, here again, it goes back to Oh Jehovah, my God, in Thee do I take refuge. Save me from all them that pursue me and deliver me. So some of the things I noticed between the the two that use the word refuge, the language following it was a little different than the ones that you that used the word I put my trust, and I thought that was interesting. So, next slide, sir. So here's what I found in Young's under uh, the word trust. And so I just kind of did a quick picture of it, page uh, 1004. Mm -hmm. And these are the verses, again, uh, using the Hebrew word chaza, um, which interesting, if you look up on it, it says also to take refuge, comma, trust. And then next slide, sir. And then when I looked at the word refuge, which was mexa, um, there are a few, a uh, few more verses there. Um, but the part that I honed in was uh, where it says mexa, not, not the manos of the others. I'm not sure what the other slide is doing there, but oh, well. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure I had a thought. If I can just show you something so take the the first letter off here that that's a m it's mem in hebrew but okay. you see the 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 this letter here the, the second letter the third letter the fourth letter going in this direction is yes. the same as this right here so what you're looking at is uh, the same root but in this okay. case it, it occurs it's called an infinitive construct so it's a it's sort of a just another form of the verb, and in this case, it, there's no language of trust. It's all refuge. That's a good, right. that's a good thing that you found there. Thank you, sir. Mm -hmm. Yay, one for me. So here we go. Uh, so I did a comparison between the trust and the refuge, and looked at the Greek word pista versus ethos and uh, boethos. Um, yes, boethos, and so. Uh, the word trust is used more in the Old Testament compared to the word refuge, uh, but they were also uh, used in slightly different contexts, which is what I wanted to look at. So on the next slide, I did uh, pick a few of the words that was related to trust. And so these are verses I found because there's a ton of them in Psalms. Like David spent a lot of time talking about trusting God, trusting God, trusting God. And in him trust. So I wanted to look at other places where this similar phrase came. So Deuteronomy talked about where are their gods, their rock in whom they trusted. Doesn't necessarily talk about Yahweh. Instead, this is in reference to just random gods and challenging gods. In Judges, it talks about then come and put your trust in my shadow. This is again in reference to a king. In Ruth, um, a full reward be given to thee of the Lord of Israel, under whose wing thou art come to trust. Again, this is in reference to Yahweh. Uh, the God of my rock in 2 Samuel, in him will I trust. He's my shield, my horn of my salvation, my high tower. Again, it is giving us a, a view of, uh, of a protection that is provided. And then hence you do go trust God. In Proverbs, uh, every word of God is pure. He is a shield unto them that put their trust in him. Again, the individual is there uh, having to act upon the, the, by faith in God. And again, and so I'll come back to that word faith. But what shall one... 
so what shall one then answer the messengers of, of the nation that, that the Lord hath found Zion and the poor of his people shall trust in it? Okay, uh, this is not reference to God. This is reference instead to uh, what God has done. The walk to go down into Egypt. Uh, sorry, I'll just go to the end part. Uh, to strengthen themselves in the strength of the Pharaoh and in trust in the shadow of Egypt. Uh, the next verse, Isaiah talks about vanity takes them, but he that put his trust in me shall possess the land. Trust in the Lord. The Lord is good, a stronghold in the day of trouble, and he knoweth them that trust in him. And finally, Zephaniah, which I picked, uh, which I used was, and they shall trust in the name of the Lord, which ties in with what all my homies were talking about before. So again, the trust is in God, in, in, in the name, again. So there's all these nuances going on. And so I did a study then on the other word. Next slide, sir. Uh, Uma, let me ask you something before we do that. Yes. So here's a rock. Yes, sir. Here's a shadow. Yep. Here are wings, right? Yes. Here's a shield. Yeah. See, all of these are like mother hen kind of protection, right? Yes. And so <laughs> which which sounds more clear? Refuge. That that you that you would locate yourself in relation to a different object that God names, yep. or that you would believe in that object that God names, which seems more obvious. Say that in other again. words, well, if I said Uma. The place to be is in the high tower. So you would right. go into the high tower. If I said, Uma, believe in the high tower. It's could because, be no, it, it goes to the person who's saying, because that's who the trust is. It's not in the object. It's the trust in the person who is validating or valuing the object in which you want to believe in. If that makes sense. Well, it does. Um, but but then we can circle back to this. Um, okay. But I just, well, friends, I want you to think about that. Uma found references that are all talking about a physical relationship between the person in the text and something that God provides, whether right. it's a rock or a shadow or a tower or wings. Okay? Yes. And then here in the, in the verses, again, a lot of them in Psalms, but I found a couple that weren't. Mm -hmm. uh, the word refuge, uh, because the Lord is his refuge. God is our refuge, uh, the rock of my strength, and my refuge is in God. Uh, pour out, pour out your hearts before Him. God is a refuge for us. But the, uh, sorry, I am a wanderer unto many, but Thou art my strong refuge. I say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress. My God in Him will I trust. And and Proverbs, uh, and His children shall have a place of refuge. And there shall be a tabernacle for the shadow in the day time from the heat and for a place of refuge and for a, and for a covert from storm and from rain. Here again, I think, at least in my understanding, is there's this protection provided. There's this umbrella that God's using in a way to protect the individual or protect us. And this is where I think in, in contrasting with the word trust and how that was played in the refuge, I saw more about the Lord as the focus of it, not the things that he put or the things that he made. Mm -hmm. uh, another question for you. So here, 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 right? Is this, are those um, plus signs or equal signs? What is plus and equal? The and. Like right. Refuge and strength. Is that refuge that is to say strength? Is it refuge that is to say a fortress or are they two different things? I think it's this is to add to it. Okay. Yeah. I'm, I'm going to go with the, the equal sign, but you that's okay. You stick with it. Okay. <laughs> Uh, so again, uh, so I looked at the um, 
the Greek words pistao and look at some of the words that went with it as in with the word refuge. And what I was found fascinating in Young's was words such as belief, assurance, faith, belief, commitment, commit to one's trust. These were all words that were coming through as a uh, way to explain what refuge was like. And it again went back to, I think, uh, in my limited understanding, what, who, who God is, right? And that we're seeking refuge because of who he is and not, not necessarily um, on our own. Like there is a, I'm not sure if I'm explaining right, but there is a assurance in who God is and therefore we seek the refuge. We're not seeking it elsewhere. So anyway, next slide, sir. And this is uh, Ephes uh, and Bota. So, th uh, so the first one had to do with uh, trust. This one had to do with refuge. So here the words hope and faith and help were what came up uh, uh, as opposed to, but interesting enough, you look at uh, in El Pizzo, the word trust comes up too, 18 times. There's definitely a connection between the two, but again, a little different than uh, Pisto, which talked more about commitment and assurance and stuff. This was more about, uh, I almost want to say like a faith thing, um, like something that is uh, outside of concreteness. Next slide, sir. So here's my conclusion. I should have put a, a question mark. I put in my trust. Taking refuge is something that one believes in, having hope in someone or something, faith and belief in someone or someone, uh, or believing in something or someone. And so that's how I interpreted these, this phrase based on Psalms 7 2. Okay. Okay. All right. Is that. Are you finished? Yes, sir. That's all. Yeah, that's all. Okay. Okay. So a couple of questions. One is, if there is a Greek word that means faith, believe, or trust, we saw it most often as trust, mm -hmm. then, then why translate a different word as trust in English, right? In other words, if, if the, if the, biblical author whether it's old testament or new testament meant for us to understand the word trust then why doesn't he use the greek word for trust if he uses a different word like he did in the old testament that uh, hasa mm -hmm. then then he must mean something not identical to trust he must mean something different because he chose a different original word does that make right. sense yeah yes sir Okay, which is what you were kind of working on. You knew yes. that they must be related to each other, but not identical. Exactly. There was a tension between the word trust and refuge. And Good. I felt like the folks that were trying to interpret them, the, mm -hmm. the, the, whoever wrote King James and whatnot, mm -hmm. themselves probably had a tension between that from the original languages. Yeah. Okay, good. Here's a second possibility is, when you were when you were using Young's to find trust in Greek, that that um, restricts all of your um, opportunities to see that word occur to the New Testament. But your text is in the Old Testament, so what you can do going forward, all of you, um, it would have been interesting if if um, I if I would have supplied Uma with the occurrences of of uh, pistuo in the Psalms in the Greek Old Testament, then he would have had an opportunity to say, okay, maybe even in the same Psalm, maybe even within verses right next to each other, I see that word refuge occur, I see the word pistis or pistuo occur. In, in that close context, does that help me distinguish between what they're trying to say? So, so do um, always check in with me email when you when you're saying, hey, I wonder what this is word is in the Old Testament in Greek, because I can help you with that very easily, and that's a very interesting pursuit. Third thing, um, where does the language of 
So if you're going to put your trust in something, Uma, I know what put something somewhere looks like. I put bread in the toaster. I put uh, meat in the refrigerator. Um, I put myself in the car. Okay, so what is this trust that I'm putting somewhere? So put your, now I need you to give me a way to understand what trust means. The way I, I raised is place my hope in. A hope. Yes. Okay. Now we have a different word again. Yeah. <laughs> so if the word yeah. is hope, then why didn't he use the word hope? Why did he use pistuo? That's a, right. So there must right. be a difference also between faith and hope. Yeah. Yeah. And, and um, the other word help that botheo yeah. means typically means help. Help. Right. Okay. Um, I want to go back because I saw something in your. Um, yeah, this is significant that Young's in the first place puts to take refuge mm -hmm. and only subsequently puts trust. Yeah, he's fast tracking you there. He's telling you something. Mm -hmm. He said the first meaning of, you know, how dictionaries do this. They number possible meanings of words, right? This is Young saying. The actual literal Greek, what David wrote in the psalm was, take refuge in the Lord. What's going on? What, 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 what were the translators thinking when in some instances they didn't use the word refuge at all? They used the word trust. They didn't say take refuge in. They said put my trust in. So these are all questions that you want to be thinking about and pay some attention to. And, and um, all, all of you are familiar with Arminianism, right? Mm -hmm. Arminianism, no? Well, some of you are. So Jacob Arminius um, was, in, in antiquity, was all about the, the, the free will and the, not only the necessity, but the, the aptitude, all human beings can choose to put their trust in the right place, in God, right? So, so where do you put your money? Do you put your money in the bank? Do you put your money in uh, a, a particular stock of a per particular company? Or do you put your money in a fund? So trust, what are we talking about here? And what does it mean for me to put it somewhere? Like it's an object. So what's happening and this is the human ego asserting itself. This is totally red pyramid world trying to take over all worlds. This is how you get from a very simple Hebrew phrase, which, which visually easy to understand, right? A storm is coming, right? A storm is coming and you're in a boat in, in the water. Where should you go? You better get your bod inside the harbor in your boat and do it now, right? So every, every sailor knows when you see a storm coming, you're going to need to get somewhere that will protect you from the storm. When, when we have a cloud burst, you watch everybody do what the psalm is talking about. This starts raining out of nowhere. What's everybody doing? They're dot, dot, getting into your car, get under an umbrella, get under a roof inside a building, go somewhere, right? So what... What David's talking about, the emphasis when he wrote Psalm 7, verse 1 or 2, depending on whether you're reading Greek or English, was what, what you're supposed to think about is something was happening that was too great for me. And, and what, what's fantastic, what we want to think about is that God provided a place for me that's safe under the shadow of his wings in his fortress. That's a very different um, mental concept than I presented Uma with um, with a with a roulette board. Uma, where would you like to put your chips, your poker chips on the on the? And Uma think, hmm, okay. And so this is totally up to Uma, and he's going to have to use his wits and his genius and his mind, and he's going to have to make the best choice for where he's going to put his chips. So notice how we've moved from a focus on 
the the storm and the remedy that God provides from the storm to me and my thinking about what my relationship with God is going to be. So it's a little bit like this phrase, um, cowboys, for sure you used to use it, but I've heard other people use it. So-and-so made his peace with God before he died. Um, I don't know how Jesus would think about me saying that. Never mind Jesus, I made my peace with God before it, like, mm, I don't think so, right? <laughs> so when when you're walking somewhere, say mom and dad are walking and you got a little three-year-old with you or a two-year-old and they're very adventuresome and they kind of get ahead of you and they're off on their own. And then some big barking dog shows up. Does that little two or three-year-old process, okay, what would I like to do next? Or is it instinctive? Bam, they're right back and bury their head inside the parents, right? Let me get in there in between you. Let me get because you are safety and that is danger, right? So it's a difference in emphasis, which is why it, it's been catching my attention over time that um, these English tra translations are, are misrepresenting the text. So chasa is very simple, seek refuge, emphasis on the action and the, what God provides for that activity when situations are too great for us. Last thing, pistuo means to believe or trust or faith. Um, notice when you use the word faith, now I have to add more words, which complicates things. It's not as clear. Have faith in, which then moves us in the direction of put my faith in, and so now I'm moving away from what the original word actually means into this ego centricity again. That's problematic. There is actually no such thing in Old or New Testaments as I put my faith in, with, with maybe only one exception I can think of. So we want to beware of that sort of thing, which is why in this course, I'm trying to give you the tools to actually know what the, the the Bible said in contrast to what different English translations are doing with it. So well done, Uma. It was a great experience. Okay. Thank you, sir. Yeah, yeah, sure. So let's go back. And uh, I'm gonna do so we we had a student that was originally registered and then dropped out. Um, so I want to have a look at the passage that would have been assigned to him. What happened? Oh, it's before Daniel. Sorry. Yeah. So Galatians 2.16 versus James 2.14. How does God save? So here is James. Okay. I need some help here tonight. So uh, Corey, would you read um, 2.21 through 2.24 from James? Yep. So how was Abraham justified according to James? Uh, was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered his son Isaac upon the altar? You see that faith was active long, along with his works, and faith was completed by works. And the scripture was fulfilled, which says, Abraham believed God, and it was reckoned to him as righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. You see that a man is justified by works and not by faith alone. Yeah, okay. So all the Lutherans in the room are getting nervous. So let's move quickly to Paul in Galatians 2.15. Um, Joel, can you read uh, that this chunk that I made the yellow line around? Galatians 2.15. What does Paul have to say about this? We ourselves, who are Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners, yet who know that a man is not justified by works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Christ Jesus in order to be justified by faith in Christ and not by works of the law, because by works of the law shall no one be justified. Do you see why people think the Bible contradicts itself? <laughs> okay, justified by works, you couldn't say it more plainly not justified by works. You said it just as plainly. Interestingly enough, Paul wrote this letter to the Galatians in 49 AD. James wrote this letter 
um, to, well, it's to everybody, of course, but he wrote it to the Jews in Jerusalem area 50. These, these, these two letters were written like a year apart from each other. Okay, now in the true Lutheran American tradition, we're going to uh, see who wins this contest. Well, James only said justified by works once. Paul said it three times. It's three to one. Paul wins. Okay, what are we to make of this? Okay, well, <laughs> what, what if Jesus says it? Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Is that by works or by faith? I don't see this tree believing in anything. This tree better cough up some fruit or down you go. So now what? Um, and, and actually, I, can sh I could show you at least five other places in the Gospels and in the epistles that say we're going to be judged by works. Okay, so now what? Semantic domain. I've talked about this before with the word that's translated tempt or test, right? So semantic domain. Okay, so how do you prove that someone or something is just? You do it from the effect. How do you know that an apple tree is an apple tree? It's got apples on it, okay? How do you become an apple tree? As in, how do you become just? God declares it so. So what's going on, and this is where background work becomes important, is James is writing to the Jewish religious authorities in his time, that, that same Pharisaic administration that's, that claims to be just, even though it knows very well it's not. Okay, What's, who's Paul writing to? Paul's writing to the Galatians, and the Judaizers had been there, who said, uh, you're not saved by faith, you're saved by doing the works of the law. So notice that James is responding to one argument, Paul is responding to another, James is working on how do you know you're actually just, Paul is working on how do you become a just person in the first place, which brings us down here. How do you become an apple tree? Hannah, if you, if you wished hard enough, if you prayed in Jesus' name, would you wake up in the morning out in your yard and you're a tree and you have apples on you? It's not how it works. Either God makes you an apple tree or he doesn't, okay? But how do you prove something's an apple tree? Friends, I have an apple tree in my yard, which only God could make one of. And you say, yeah, right. I said, okay, come on, pick an apple off of it and see for yourself. So that's how it works. So in a simplified form, but very like of critical importance. How are we saved? Saved by grace. How are we judged? Judged by works of the law. Where did you get those works of the law that justified you on the judgment day? Corey, where'd you get those works? Where'd you get all those good works that God judged you according to on judgment day? From God. From God. <laughs> and interestingly, we get them in two ways. Yes? So one of the remedies of God's grace towards us is imputation, right? So the good works of Jesus are imputed to our account, just like our guilt's imputed to his. But we need to also remember that God's word regenerates our soul, and the Holy Spirit works in our soul so that we actually do good works. We actually, according to our regenerate soul, only do the right thing all the time. So both witnesses are there for us. Okay, so that's how you resolve that pesky uh, situation. Let me just um, see what else here. Um, but it's 834. Oh, yeah. So this is my background, which is why I assigned this verse. Put your faith in versus seek refuge in, right? So all these different times that that um, psalms are translated, put your trust in or put your faith in. There's no put your there. There's, there's no there's no verb plus personal pronoun plus noun. It's just simply trusts. So what does that mean, right? 
you could go to the New Testament and listen to Jesus say, unless you repent and become as a child, you can't enter the kingdom of heaven. So that must have something to do with faith, belief, and trust. In all these, in these other instances, it's translated, put your faith in, but it actually much more simply means to seek refuge in. Interestingly, here, while I was looking up examples of put your trust in, I found 31 times in the Psalms put to shame. So here is actually the use of put, put something somewhere, but it has to do with shame, and that's for another day. Fortunately, uh, we don't have to worry about being put to shame. We can be embarrassed in class together. That's not the same. <laughs> we'll recover. Okay. Um, so um, Kingston mentioned this earlier, like what the heck is all this junk? Okay, once again, don't be afraid to look at the bottom of the page in Young's Concordance, and you'll see the asterisk, asterisk is there. You'll see some other symbols that they will explain at the bottom. Um, more particularly, what, what we're getting at here is, this is the word name that occurs in the dative case or named in the dative case. So onoma in the dative uh, could mean a number of different things. It could mean by means of the name or in, as in location in the name of. It's just letting you know that because Greek is an inflected language, dative case has significance, right? So in English, you have to add prepositions to do the same thing that happens without prepositions in Greek. Notice this is with the dative of relationship or autos meaning the thing itself. Okay, now, practically speaking, when you're going to go pursue um, occasions where a word occurs, you can just ignore all that junk because it doesn't matter. What matters to you is that you're going to find where the word occurs in its context in the New Testament and Old Testament and, and you, you'll see for yourself the dynamics that are going on in the grammar. So the short answer is you can ignore that, that extra junk, just track down the word, right? So you wanna go to the back of Young's and, and, and uh, sorry, sorry, wrong. You're in the back of Young's. So you know that you can look up the word name in the front part of Young's and you'll find 193 citations, you should also then go to called in the front part of Young's, and you'll find three instances where this word occurs. You should go to named, and you'll find, look at, this is significance, 24 times what's going on. So this is telling you, don't ignore these other places in the, in the King James or in the rest of the Bible where this original Greek word occurs very simply. So what I'm getting at is you can kind of ignore the English at this point. We're just using it to make sure that you get all of the places where the original word occurs. Yes? This is why this is so much easier if you're working in Hebrew or in Greek, because you don't have to mess around with all this stuff. But maybe, practically speaking, you're not going to learn Greek or Hebrew so this is more work, but it's, it's accessible to you, and that's, that's an advantage, okay? Um, yeah, so notice here, too, um, there are some notes at the very beginning of the Greek index section in the back. You might want to give those a read. Same thing in the Hebrew part, explanatory notes. You might want to give those a look sometime when you have a chance. All right, I was going to show you something um, kind of interesting, but I'm going to put it off for a week, but I'll let you think about it, okay? Um, there are articles written in the last uh, 100 years, um, lots of articles actually in the last 200 years that, that um, claim that they have exposed the false nature of the Bible. Here's an example of how you know the Bible, it does not tell you the truth, and it was not written by God, nor by apostles of Jesus. The whole thing's terrible, you should burn them all. 
Okay, here's an example. Romans 2, verse 27, Paul is talking about the Jews and the trouble that they make for the truth, and he quotes the Old Testament. The name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you, okay? Modern critical scholars assume that Paul is quoting Isaiah, right? And my name is blasphemed continually every day, right? Why? Because the Israelites are being abused by the nations around them. So in Isaiah's context, Israel is the innocent party. And because they're abused, or maybe um, uh, an example of the abuse that Israel is experiencing is abusing Israel is a way by which you can blaspheme God. That's not what Paul's talking about. Paul is blaming the Jews. The Jews are the reason that the Gentiles are blaspheming God. So you see the argument. Paul, Paul's just willy-nilly. He's just quoting Old Testament Bible passages any old which way he pleases, not paying any attention to the Old Testament context. Is that true? Well, wait a minute. Here in Ezekiel 36, right? Okay. Here is, where is it? Yeah, here it is. My holy name, which the house of Israel had profaned among the nations. So in Ezekiel, Israel is the villain, just like Paul is claiming in Romans 2.27. So why did modern critical scholars assume that Paul is quoting Isaiah instead of quoting, where's the, here's, here's the word profane. Okay, well, the reason is that in the Greek Old Testament, the word that Paul's using here is the same word as Isaiah's using here. Ezekiel's using a different word, which is why it's translated profaned and not blasphemed, even though it basically means the same thing. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let you stew on that for a week <laughs> and see if we should throw out the epistles of Paul because he's a big fat liar and a cheat, or is something else going on, and how would we figure that out? All right. Thanks for a great evening, friends. Now, at this point, I'm going to stick around for whoever can or wants to stick around, um, and, and, and particularly Corey, Hannah. David, Joel, and Kevin, because you're next up, even though it's two weeks away from tonight. So, um, Corey, do you have something you want to ask about 2 Samuel 11, verse 1? Yeah. I thought you might. <laughs> um, so, looking at 2 Samuel, let me pull it up really quick. So, 2 Samuel 11, 1. Um, in the spring of the year, when kings go out to ba battle, David was in his house. Go on. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So big deal. Who cares? <laughs> so should I do some kind of study on like when, when kings are supposed to go out into battle? Um, should I like, so kind of that in contrast to David remaining or tarrying at Jerusalem? Yeah, you, so friends, notice Corey's using some instincts here. Listen again. In the spring of the year, when kings go out to battle, David was in his house. Everybody know what spring is, what a year is, what a battle is, what a house is. Notice, right? You can, you can read that sentence. I probably don't need to look through Young's Concordance to find out what any of those words means. So the problem is somewhere else, right? What's going on with David's location in contrast with everybody else's? You're on it, Corey, so take that path. Okay. Good. And, and then one more quick question. So in the passage, it says David tarried still, yeah. um, but still isn't in the concordance. So I was wondering if that's like an emphasis on tarried or... That's because... Um, the KJV used two English words to translate one. Okay. That is very simple in Hebrew, just stayed. He okay. remained, right? Yeah. Okay, right, cool. Thank you. You're welcome. Hannah? 
Hannah has song, song of Solomon 2, verse 7, right? I beseech you by the, um, by the, O daughters of Jerusalem, by the does and by the gazelles of the field, that you do not stir up or awaken love until it pleases. What could be more clear, Hannah? What would you like to know? <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, I think initially my, well, the, the initial grid here um, has do not stir up, obviously do right. not, right. Uh, obvious. Um, so I went to stir and I yeah. haven't looked much at this, mm -hmm. um, but that was my first thought. I have no idea what's going on with the gazelles and the deer yeah. also. Yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> <laughs> Okay, friends, Hannah's got a number of problems in her verse. <laughs> first of all, I adjure you. What the heck does adjure mean? Now, now I gave her a little focus here. So, so concentrate on the do not stir up, but I just want to talk you through this, right? You can actually figure out if you use Young's concordance, it's not that hard to figure out what adjure means. Okay. It's making, I'm not going to tell you, but it's not hard. So there's for I adjure you. Next, daughters of Jerusalem. Who are the daughters of Jerusalem and why not the sons of Jerusalem? Why not the moms of Jerusalem? What the heck is that about? Okay, that's two. That you do not stir up or awaken. So you actually have two words, stir up or awaken. But the, but the, but the real sneaky word is love. What are we talking about here? What aren't you supposed to stir up or awaken? Until it pleases, now you probably know what until means, but what does until it pleases mean? And I'll guarantee you, you look through different English translations at Song of Solomon 2 verse 7, you're going to see a wild variety of, because none of them knows what the heck he's talking about. <laughs> so, um, but, but time in terms of efficiency, Hannah, so this is what I could recommend, right? First of all, figure out what love is. What aren't we supposed to stir up or awaken, right? You might give a quick look to stir up or awaken, but you have two words there to work with, so that's a little bit helpful, right? Everybody, stir up would mean one thing if you were making pancakes for breakfast, right? But stir up or awaken, that's not a stir up something outside of myself, that's a stir up inside of myself, right? So we, we got some hints there. And then I would move on, Hannah, if you have time to see what you can figure out about until it pleases. Uh, but so take this incrementally, right? As much, as much as you have time, figure out love, then figure out stir up awaken, or at least confirm what we're, our suspicions are, then move on to uh, until it pleases and just give us what you got when the time comes okay. yeah Thanks. yeah you're welcome is this helpful everybody yeah okay um david um john 13 3 jesus uh something about what precedes his washing the disciples feet right okay um also in your verse then david um, it reads like this, um, Jesus, when supper had ended, knowing that the Father had put all things into his hands, that he had come from God and was going to God, put aside his garments, and so forth, right? right. Like a little bit like, um, whose was it? Like Corey's verse. Does it sound like there's any tricky words in there? Right? God gave all things into Jesus' hands. It seems like we would know what that means. Jesus came from God. We know what that Jesus was going to God. Okay, so the, the question about John 13, 3 isn't what Jesus is saying to us in verse 3. It's what does it have to do with what comes next? He sets aside his garments and washes the disciples' feet. See, you could leave verse 3 out, right? So right. after supper had ended, Jesus girded himself with a towel and washed the disciples' feet. So who cares what verse 3 says? 
that's what you're working on, David. Got it. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Uh, Joel. Yes. Uh, it, it, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. First, first Corinthians nine, verse nine. <laughs> You have a fun verse, right? Because Paul's, Paul's talking about, so Paul quotes the Old Testament, you shall not mu muzzle an ox when it treads out the grain, right? Joel, any trouble with ox, muzzle, tread, grain? No, it's very straightforward. Yeah, never do that. You would know if you had muzzled your ox or not. Yeah. Okay. Then what's cool is Paul says, do you think God really gives a rip about oxen? <laughs> Like God, God doesn't, he didn't say that because he's worried about oxen. Okay. So Joel, why did he say it? That's your first assignment, right? So what's going on that Paul is, that Paul is addressing that Old Testament law as a remedy for, right? And Joel actually has a, has a, has a class that's a standalone. If you guys had another 12 years to devote we could have a class called New Testament's Use of the Old. And that was a class I took, among others, in, in my graduate program. A whole semester devoted just to what's going on with how the Old Testament shows up in the New Testament. So, so Joel, that's yours, right? So you have a, actually a hermeneutical principle that's connected to your passage besides helping us understand what Paul's trying to say here. Yeah? I like it. Okay. And last of all, Kevin, Deuteronomy 6.4, Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your strength. And these words which I teach you today, I've gone beyond 6.4, but there you go. So, Kevin, you have a question. Yes, I actually do have a question. Um, the way that our schedule has been, I've always gone on the following week. Should we rotate me to the next week since Anthony's missing and then we don't have to cram in uh, for the first first half of the class? Yeah, you, you got the bad, a bad place in the lineup, didn't you? You're on the bubble. There's four before you and four after you. Um, maybe the solution is this, um, Kevin. I should just um, put a sock in it the first for the first week and let the five of you do your presentations. And then this, the following week after the next four have gone, then I could share with you other examples that I have instead of getting in the way. I think I like that approach best. All right. So I'm gonna zip it <laughs> week one and we'll hear from Kevin. <laughs> and then and then i'll we'll see what we have time for the following yeah okay awesome um and question pertaining to the verse um yeah actually no i'm good i uh have not looked at it thoroughly enough to have questions but if there's anywhere that you would like to point me to i take note yeah um kevin actually i think you and i should have a private conversation at this point because um, as I think about it, and this is not what I intended, but I'm not sure that you have the tools to discover the problem with that verse. And so I'm not sure that's a good verse for you. So um, can, can you, let's I'll send zoom. you an email and then I will schedule, I will yes. try to, we will schedule something. Yes, let's find a time and we'll Zoom and we'll talk this through. Awesome, thank you. Thank you, Kevin. Okay, everybody else okay to wait um, until week after? Well, let me see. Nathan, are you still here? Yeah, Nathan. Um, John three fourteen. The this the the tricky part in your verse is the word as. So as Moses lifted the serpent in the wilderness, right? So as is the first step. That's just a comparison. So also the son of man must be lifted up. The word that's translated must there, like it has to be this way. It can't be any other way. So Nathan, it sounds like what Jesus is saying is 
because Moses put a bronze snake on a pole during the Exodus, Jesus has to die by crucifixion. As in, if Moses had just gone out there and chopped the head off a snake, then Jesus could have died a fast, painless death by beheading. So how should we understand that? Does that make sense to you, what I'm asking? Yeah, okay, good. Um, Kingston, are you still here? Sort of, not really. Yes, sir. Yeah, yeah okay, I'm Kingston. Here. Okay. Um, your verse is sort of self-contained. So you, you need to tell us which word for blessed is used in Revelation 1, verse 3. Mm -hmm. And you need to tell us how, how the rest of that verse informs us about mm -hmm. that blessing. Okay, so there's, there's three other phrases that follow the word blessed there. One, two, three phrases. What do they mean? And what do they teach us about this blessedness? Okay. 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 Uh, Daniel, in Romans 10, verse 9, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe on him in your heart, you will be saved. Daniel, how is that not good works? There's a condition that I'm that Paul's telling me I have to meet. I have to confess with my mouth and believe in my heart. And Daniel, what happens if I have a baby and it dies and it hasn't even learned to talk yet? Is the, is the baby lost because it did not confess with its mouth? Follow? So those are your problems to work on, okay? And Thank you, Dr. Shalat. Yeah, I'm gonna drop out now. Thank you so yep, much. Fine. Yep, no worries. And then Kingston, um, not Kingston. Sorry, Uma, Uma, Uma's gone. So we'll catch up with Uma next week. Okay, everybody. I hope this is helpful. It looks good. All right. Have a great Thank two you. weeks. I'll see you in two weeks. You too. Thank you. Thank you. God Thank bless. You. Take Thank care. You.